The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Welcome back to the Massive Open Online Orchestration course. I'm your instructor, Thomas Goss. So far in this series, we've studied the unaccompanied scoring of the three members of the violin family, violin, viola, and cello. We've also taken a look at the violin-piano duo and the piano trio as an introduction to ensemble scoring. Today, we're going to explore ensemble scoring without the piano and just put those three members of the violin family together into a string trio. Of course, there are any number of ways we might have combined string instruments up to now. Violin duos are a form to which quite a few composers have contributed. It's only natural that a couple of violinists might want to play duets as a kind of musical socializing, or for a master to play alongside a pupil. Other duos team the violin up with a viola, or with the cello. Though this kind of writing certainly contains its own lessons, we're passing over the string duo genre for now and building on our training toward more universally established forms. Information tends to be a little vague on the origins of the string trio, with the common claim that it evolved out of the Baroque trio. Then again, the earliest version of string trio scoring was essentially a violin duo plus cello. Perhaps it was simply easier back then to find a couple of violinists and a cellist, rather than the more standard and well-balanced trio of violin, viola, and cello. For our purposes today, I have to say that it really doesn't matter who wrote the first standard string trio, or how they progressed the form. We'll simply be looking at the best examples of the genre from the end of the classical period, and observing the strong, well-developed approaches by the greatest composers of that time, Mozart, Beethoven, and Schubert. There's nothing about these approaches that can't be adapted or updated to fit your own style of composing. I feel that the string trios they composed represent less an evolution of the Baroque trio and more an adaptation of the string quartet form. Each of these three masters were among the greatest of string quartet composers, and their trios share a lot of structural aspects with their quartets. Thus, studying these trios is a significant step forward in understanding the string quartet, which many composers consider the greatest chamber music form ever devised. But in my opinion, the trio can actually be harder, not easier, to compose. There's less room for error, and one less voice to cushion an idea in development. It's a case of simplicity demanding closer attention to function than you might otherwise be used to in your scoring up to now. Let's see why as we study the string trio in today's lecture. Before we study this lesson's scores, let's look at the realities of combining the three voices of violin, viola, and cello. There's a natural balance of range and function here that will probably appear obvious to you by now. The cello mostly covering the bass, with the violin taking the lead. The viola naturally sits in the middle, moderating between these two roles. If that's all there was to it, then the trio would be an extremely safe and dull genre. Yet it's one of the most vital of chamber music forms, in which anything can happen, and there are very strong demands upon both the ingenuity of the composer and the resources of the players. Instruments frequently change roles, with the viola often taking the lead, or the cello, or even the viola covering the bass line while the violin and cello play duos. We'll cover this role swapping in detail, but first it would be useful for you to review or complete your study of these instruments in your orchestration resources. Watch the sections in the Orchestration 101, the String Section course, about orchestral roles and playing solo. Much of the information there will apply to what we're focusing on here. As to my 100 Orchestration Tips book, now's the time to catch up on reading tips 86 and especially 88, discussing viola blending and viola as bass. That leaves your orchestration manual. If you've got any edition of the Adler, then good for you. There's a chapter on string scoring that's relevant to what we're about to study today. 
read the first few sections that discuss the individual functions of voices. Piston and Kennan only discuss string functions in the sense of larger overall scoring. But don't worry, I'll cover what you need to know in this lecture. Just one more preliminary observation. I predict that your ability to absorb the training in MOOC Lesson 5 on unaccompanied viola scoring will largely dictate your success scoring string trios. As I explained in that video, we're accustomed to hearing violin and cello in more prominent roles. But not only does that mean that we subsequently need to do a lot of catching up with the viola, we need to understand that viola is really the glue that holds the string trio together. Having poor alto clef reading skills and only a passing acquaintance with the viola is very likely to make your scoring efforts much weaker than they should be. So once again, go back and study the viola right now if you can't honestly say you've gained a level of confidence scoring for it. There's a fundamental difference between this genre and all of the others we've studied up to now. On the one hand, there's no piano involved. In the trio and duo scoring from lessons two and four, we had to moderate the approach of the strings to compensate for the percussive sound of the piano. That actually imposes a somewhat unnatural average dynamic onto the strings. In softer passages, the strings simply cannot go down to a whisper without slipping underneath the piano's tones, however gently played. Similarly, even with the pianist pulling their punches, the strings will have to play extra forcefully in louder passages. So the act of removing the piano makes an enormous difference to the sound, in that the strings will find a more natural general spectrum of tone, and can literally play to the room, inhabiting an acoustic space much more instinctively without any added complications. On the other hand, the individual characteristics that we studied so closely in detail in lessons 1, 3, and 5 are still relevant but they cannot be dominant for their own sake. Rather, they must become mutually reliant upon one another, even in passages where one voice or another leads. Orchestration manuals are famous for saying that the strings are generally homogeneous in tone, and that's sort of true, and yet the greatest orchestrators know how to make the most of ranges and registers to individualize functions, musical passages, and meaning in string scoring. And that's actually more and more true as the size of the string ensemble gets smaller and smaller. A 15-piece string ensemble will have a much more vibrant and dynamically varied tone than a 50- to 60-piece string orchestra. From there, the musical lines become ever more individual and intimate as we reduce down from octet to sextet to quintet to quartet, and ultimately to the smallest possible string ensemble of trio. That's another reason why I feel that trio scoring is actually more challenging a form than quartet scoring. You have to get the most out of the fewest voices, and balance the natural individuality of each voice against its group role. To see how this works, let's pick apart a typical passage of string trio scoring. In the opening of the rondo from Mozart's Divertimento in E-flat, Kirchel 563, the three voices are locked into position for the entire exposition, each in their most traditional roles and typical registers. The violin states the theme in that sweet spot from the top of the staff to an octave above. The viola plays a regular series of broken triad figures, mostly in comfortable positions on the lower strings, a very accommodating register for accompaniment. Underneath it all, the cello plugs away with a very simple bass line, mostly ones and fives, with the occasional four and three thrown in for a sense of contrary motion. Like the other instruments, the cello sits in a specific register for its role, playing mostly on the bottom strings and staying out of tenor territory. As I play the audio for this, really listen to not only the functions of the music, but also the timbres of the instruments and how they complement each other. Notice how the violin was really able to sing out clearly? The trick here is that the three voices are for the most part separated across three octaves, each rarely intruding on the other's territory. With clearly defined regions, 
It's easy for each instrument to stand on its own functionally. But there's more to it than that. Did you notice that the cello's bass line was nicely solid, while the viola's accompaniment was typically warm and husky? That's such a simple observation, but it reveals within it one reason why string quartets are so enormously popular, while the string trio was quite wanting in solid repertoire. It's also the reason why string sections in orchestras contain first and second violin groups. When the leading melodic vehicle of the violin sits above another violin, then the closeness of the timbres allows for a more balanced and homogeneous sound. There are other reasons alongside this, of course, such as there being a huge prevalence of violinists versus violists and cellists, or that the second violin gives the first a similar voice to work with and against. But in my role as an orchestrator and arranger, I see the first reason of tonal balance as the most pressing. And yet that's another factor making good string trio scoring a bit trickier than quartet scoring. The naturally clear, bright tone of the violin is partnered with two somewhat darker companions. All the more reasons why the composer should use the timbral qualities of the registers to their best advantage. This whole question of balancing timbres is clearest when scoring close harmony. In the following passage from the first movement of Beethoven's string trio, Opus 9, No. 1, the voices start in four-part harmony, with the violins double-stopping surrounding the viola's harmonization of the melody. This is nearly quartet scoring, but look at what the juxtaposition of the parts achieves for the instrumental registers. The violin part can only be played on the lowest two strings, as the bottom notes of the double stops are all lower than the third string. Here the violin is closest in tone to the viola, and the pianissimo scoring helps the upper line of the music fit the gentler D string quite aptly. The viola plays a perfect middle register part, never ascending as high as the A string. Meanwhile, the cello sits nicely in its bass staff range. Listen for the timbral outcomes of such scoring, how nicely dark the music sounds, even though played lightly staccato. Then observe the color of the development passage that follows. Not the melody in the violin, but the closely harmonized accompaniment of cello and tenor register, with the viola only climbing a little above its middle register here and there. When close harmonies in the lower registers are pushed to fortissimo, the texture can become incredibly dark. Classical era composers didn't seem to like this sound too much, but it was an apt color for late romantic composers. Listen to the rich, foreboding quality of this passage from Max Reger's second trio, Movement 1. It starts with a triple octave statement, played on the lowest, gruffest string of each instrument leaps up nearly two octaves, and then climbs back down to a hugely forceful close harmony in the low register once again. There's a rawness to the sound that's almost out of control. <laughs> Taken to the highest register, the yearning tones of the cello and viola dominate the close harmonies, especially in more emphatic scoring. Here's where string trios possess a certain emotional quality that's typically edgier than quartets. <laughs> 
This is clear even in a simply scored movement like the minuet from Schubert's second string trio. Here the violin is in its middle range, the viola in its middle high register, and the cello comfortably inhabiting the tenor clef. Listen to the tempered brightness of the timbre at the start. How the slightly rougher tones of the lower strings become radiant when capped by the violin. Despite this cohesion, timbral differentiation is quite easy to achieve by slightly pulling apart the ranges and functions. That's obvious at the start of the second section, but listen for the more subtle effect after the final restatement of the main theme, where the unique sound of the higher-placed viola and cello provides a lovely contrast to the violin's arcing lines. In a string quartet, such a passage might be scored with a more convenient second violin on the middle voice and viola on the bottom, but then this contrast would be lost. There may be fewer examples of emphatic close harmonies for their own sake in classical period string trios, but the composers of that time did like to contrast close harmonies with open harmonies, as both a timbral and a dynamic effect. Directly following the opening of that rondo we heard a few minutes ago from Mozart's Divertimento, closely spaced mid-range triads are set against wide voicings. Notice how Mozart perfectly balances the viola's middle voice role, supporting the violin on the root of an open fifth, and then jumping down to harmonize the cello as the top of a row of ascending tenths. As both the viola and violin lines are leading back to a single G, the viola jumps down on the downbeat to a B-flat. Then Mozart reuses the curve of this bar to set up contrary motion against the developing violin passage that follows. A simple yet ingenious strategy. This naturally leads to the question of how well the wider spacing of harmonies and independent voices works in string trio scoring. And the answer is, quite well, so long as the voicings and part writing are strong. Here's a characteristic passage from Beethoven's fourth string trio, the Opus 9, number 3, starting with strong contrasts of register leaping up and down harmonically, with a broader and broader separation of parts. Note that the difference between close and open scoring is a textural quality that can be graduated for its own dynamic effect, whether building energy or releasing into a rather dreamy, wide-reaching soundscape. This stays consistent in any context here in Beethoven's approach, whether contrapuntal, or chordal, or danceably rhythmic. There's an enormous amount of ground to cover when dealing with scoring three voices, of whatever instrumentation. As I've made clear with this course all along, I'd like to keep the focus firmly on the ways in which texture, balance, and function relate to the unique qualities of each instrument, and their possibilities in different combinations. <laughs> 
But just because I don't cover harmonic rhythm or counterpoint here doesn't mean that you shouldn't study that as well. In fact, I'm hoping that you'll at least get up to speed a bit with these topics so I don't have to backtrack too much. So let's just limit most of our discussion of function right now to the melodic and thematic. Or, more simply put, what are some good strategies for assigning the most prominent voice to each member of the trio, and what are the implications for the accompanying voices in each case? The most obvious scoring strategy is the one we saw in the Mozart Rondo. Violin on melody, viola playing patterns for accompaniment, and the cello covering the bass. Even within this standard architecture, you'll find a huge variety of approaches. I love this passage of the Rondo from Beethoven's fourth trio. Beethoven uses simple but effective part writing to create motion and interest between the parts, while still keeping them interdependent. Just like Mozart and Haydn before him, Beethoven wastes no gesture, but finds different ways to get the most variation out of the fewest ideas, which become all the more powerful for the intensity of their development. Eventually, when the structure gives way to imitation between parts, and more democratic sharing of the lead role, notice how the elements of accompaniment are reintroduced, such as here where the cello and violin surround the viola's melodic statement with that syncopated bass line. I'll let this excerpt play out to the end of the episode, where the strings take up dreamy zigzagging patterns all the way up to this extraordinarily voiced chord. Pay close attention to the sound of that configuration, as we'll discuss such voice crossings in a little while. You can find many such passages throughout the literature with similar basic structure. Since every instrument is in its ideal position, it's easy to come up with many very natural sounding approaches. But let's take a look at how the equation changes when the cello or the viola take the lead melodically without crossing over the natural range of their ensemble partners. Back to the Mozart divertimento. In the second movement's final variation, the viola plays a very simple, slow, extended melody. At almost no point anywhere does any voice cross, despite the bustling cello part and the frantic violin runs. Note how the balance works because a fast detaché bowing lightens the outer parts, while the viola stands out naturally with nice long bow strokes. <laughs> classical period scores, the cello rarely plays a leading bass register melody without being part of a contrapuntal texture, trading off thematic duties with the other players. You can see a prime example of this in the middle of the first movement of Beethoven's second string trio, the Opus 9 No. 1. Beethoven starts with patterns of simple alternating intervals in violin. Then he scores a second half to each melodic statement that can be developed, serve as counterpoint and accompaniment to another instrument statement, or even be fragmented into little figures. This keeps the resulting individuality of each voice from overwhelming the other, and the whole thing locks together nicely like thematic clockworks. ¶¶ 
course, Beethoven could also have scored a longer cello solo in the bass register, and accompanied it in just about any other way, with rhythmic patterns, harmony, or figuration. In your own scoring, it's important to remember that using fewer voices means that less counts for more. It's not necessary to overload your accompaniments with double stops or complex figuration. Get the most meaning out of the least amount of notes, and your trio scoring will be all the stronger for it. We'll study string accompaniment styles in more detail in our final lesson of this Term 1 MOOC course. For now, let's take a look at a few here, and note how economy plays a role in keeping the scoring simple yet effective. Schubert is a master of accompaniment styles, and his music is very much in touch with the popular song and dance forms of his time. The rondo of his second string trio is based on an écossaise, a very lively two-step dance. The accompaniments to the brisk, piping melody are very simple, and quite similar to his piano écossaises. This central passage could easily be adapted as a piano piece, especially with the comfortable fit of the viola and cello parts to the left hand, with a little tweaking. Sometimes the best and simplest accompaniment is to just repeat notes. The natural bounciness of bowing in measured tremolos can substitute for arpeggiated patterns or alternating intervals when adapting accompaniment styles from piano to strings. Schubert's first string trio features several passages in which a single note is repeated half a dozen bars, keeping the energy and pacing going while the other instruments have more significantly functional parts. Here's where an informed approach to string instrumentation really counts. You can build a far more convincing rhythmic and harmonic landscape if you use the instruments in a natural way. For instance, this opening passage speaks of more than a decade of professional experience as a string player, even though its composer Beethoven was more of a pianist than a violist, and was only in his mid to late twenties when he wrote it. Observe the nicely placed registers of the accompaniment, and how easily all the parts sit on the instruments. Particularly, the slurred staccatos give the music a kind of pulse that just naturally fits the strings. Patterns are a typical way of controlling the harmony, rhythm, and energy of a string score, and Beethoven had a unique strength in this regard. <laughs> 
one of my favorite bits of string trio fury is from the finale of his Opus 9 number 1, where all voices combine in a series of patterns that build dynamically over and over again, renewing the sense of urgency to return to the tonic. Once again, the registers are nicely placed, and the technique very natural to the instruments, yet the pace is huge. Back in Lesson 4 of this Term 1 MOOC, I introduced the concept of alliances, instruments that work together to explore a musical idea, often in contrast or opposition to another instrument. In that lesson, we examined how the very natural alliance of violin and cello took a whole generation to evolve out of the originally piano-focused trio form. When we dispense with the piano and add a viola, a whole plethora of possible alliances and oppositions opens up, with the palette of colors restricted to string tone and technique. These alliances can be universal, as when composers assign triple octave melodic passages, or oppositional in timbre, pitting pizzicato against bowed strings, for instance. Two instruments can form an alliance to play an accompaniment style as we've seen, or play together in harmony or octaves over a bass. I'll return to this topic over the final two lessons, but I strongly recommend that you make a special study of how alliances are scored in this lesson's score reading assignments. Even the simplest of combinations can prove effective if the roles are well defined. Our last main area of study in Lesson 6 is crossing voices. This approach is crucial in understanding how the overall sound of a string ensemble can be reshaped. As we saw in many examples so far, string trio scoring can easily default to the standard strategy of all voices in their optimum registers for a very cohesive sound. This uniformity of tone can be largely maintained when two or all three voices ascend or descend across their registers in the same general direction but crossing voices subverts this whole plan in two different ways. The voice which crosses upwards, like a viola across the violin, or even the cello over both the viola and violin, will tend to speak as a chestier, more heart-strung high voice than the violin. Conversely, those normally higher voices which now must support underneath will usually be played on their lowest strings, like sol G for violin and sol C for viola. Admittedly, Cello solos tend to represent the bulk of voice crossing and trio scoring, if not string ensemble scoring in general. For the classical era composers, these solos weren't limited to long, flowing adagio melodies, but might also serve as opening statements for faster movements. In this next excerpt from the rondo of Beethoven's third string trio, watch for two things. First, how the opening cello solo becomes a dialogue with the violin, and second, how publishers of this period tended to score the tenor register in treble clef, sounding down an octave. It's a little confusing at first, but you can soon adapt to such reading, and you'll need to in several of these period scores. With viola as the closest instrument in pitch to the violin, there will be some inevitable trading off between roles in which voice crossing will naturally play a part. Mozart's Divertimento is full of examples of the viola emerging to quickly take a turn at the melody, perhaps soaring momentarily over the violin before diving back down again. Mozart establishes this approach from the first passage of the first movement. In general, his chamber viola parts are anything but boring, and even less so here. 
every voice crossing strategy in a string trio, there are a set of timbral implications. We already explored what might happen with cello or viola crossing upward. Consider the reverse as well, with viola or violin crossing downward to a featured line of music, forcing the accompanying texture and functions upward. You'll have a very rich statement on the lowest string on your leading instrument, with somewhat understated support tending towards higher strings on the other instruments. This shouldn't be too hard to balance if you mark your dynamics clearly, and the functions of the parts are well defined. It's important to think over the finer points of texture and string scoring, but don't assume that your score has failed if you don't take every little detail into account. In general, string players are very good at listening to each other and doing a lot of balancing and adjusting their approach on the fly so that there's a smoother, more integrated sound. But if you think of a way in which tone production, registers, and placement of voices can all conspire to explore different types of timbres and musical meanings, then by all means try it out. I tinker with standard formulas all the time in chamber scoring, and you'll see that even in these early examples, the great composers did as well. One last thing I strongly recommend is to keep double stops to a minimum. Their appearance should be incidental, perhaps showing up here or there to fill in a texture or harmony. Otherwise, don't indulge. These aren't quartets we're scoring, but trios. You'll get the strongest results from the most opportune use of the fewest voices. Trios have a certain vitality and economy to them that you'll never learn if you keep inserting an extra voice all the time. So save it for Lesson 8's string quartet assignment, and remember that the natural lushness of combined strings carries within it enough tone to fill up the seeming voids even in widely spaced lines and harmonic voicings. So your assignment this lesson is to score a 2-3 to three minute work for string trio in your own idiom, combining our past approaches with those we covered in this lesson. Apply the principles of tone production, melodic phrasing, contrasts of register, and instrumental alliances alongside our new areas of study. Make logical, compelling use of close and open voices. Balance timbres and functions by assigning leading roles across their most apt registers, and then support those passages with convincing and ingenious accompaniment styles. Give the music more intrigue with meaningful alliances and subversive voice crossings. We're getting to the point where the available scoring approaches may outnumber your ideas, but that's a good thing. You don't have to make use of every approach, but on the other hand, you may find yourself very naturally doing all this and more within the first 16 bars. The more comfortable you can get with string trio scoring, the more inevitable the next two lessons will seem, when we add either a piano or a second violin to these three unique voices. A lot of the foundation I've laid down here will take on new meanings and context in those forms, while still remaining firm under your artistic feet. And that will simply make all of your scoring better across the board, whether you're composing for SATB choir, or mixed chamber, or even orchestrating. Get to work on that, and I'll see you next lesson.